So t in today's translator, what I want to do is I want to translate something that you may have heard before in chemistry. That is the specific heat capacity of water is 4.18 or 4.184 joules per gram per degree Celsius. You may have also heard this without numbers. The specific heat capacity of water is very large. It's huge. It has huge consequences on weather. It has great benefits for doing calorimetry experiments. I'm sure you have heard a statement such as these if you've taken chemistry. And what I have brewing for us over here is a nice little demonstration that goes along with it. So I just have some crazy, crazy hot water. You can see I've got it turned all the way up to 10. You can probably hear that. And I put a little bit of aluminum in there. And so this is a demo that, that I like to do. That tends to illustrate the point. What I want to do then is I want to take this. And I'm going to pick up this aluminum out of boiling crazy hot water. You can hear that splishing and splashing. And I'm just going to grab it with my hands. And it's warm, it's hot, but it's weird that something that could definitely burn me and then I put metal into it and make a really, really hot metal does not burn me. And so this is something I've been holding the whole time. Um, why is it that the metal doesn't burn someone, whereas we know that if I were to take this water right now and pour it on someone that it would be disastrous? What's the difference between this and this? And so the answer we give gets caught up in energy. And a lot of times that means that people don't really get a chance to understand what it is that's happening. So let's take a minute and go through and break this down a little bit and make sure that we don't miss the chemistry behind specific heat capacity that, that we want. Now, first of all, one of the big things that's taught about specific heat capacity is that it's very large for water. So a metal, like aluminum, will have a specific heat capacity of somewhere between you know, a, a little under, a fraction of one and maybe up to two at the most, but most of them are centered somewhere around one. So why does water take four times as much energy to raise its temperature? Okay, and the problem with that, that discussion is we really need to understand physics well to do it. When I'm heating up this water over here using the hot plate, what I'm doing is the hot plate is pushing on the beaker, which is pushing on the water. And so when it pushes on the water, the water will move faster. And so the temperature is going up because of that pushing. So, so when we look at something like water, the question then is, why when I push on water does it not just move faster? If I push on aluminum, it moves faster and its temperature goes up. And so its specific heat capacity is very low. So if I have a water molecule, and I have an aluminum atom, when I push on this, it moves faster in that direction, and so its temperature is going up very quickly with proportional to how much I've, energy I've given to it, how much heat I've exerted. Now, if I push on water the same amount, I don't get the same motion increase, and so why? So that as we're drawing this, I think this should start to make a little sense. When you push on water, it doesn't just move faster. It has bonds, it has intermolecular forces, and that can cause things to happen besides just motion, just translational moving in that direction water can start to wiggle, it can start to scissor, it can start to rotate, it can do all of these different things and therefore it has more capacity to, to store energy is the way we would say it, uh, but basically when you push on it, it doesn't just move faster, it also does wiggling and it does waggling and it does re revolving and rotating and all of these different things cause this to have a higher specific heat capacity. Whereas when you push on aluminum, well, it, it moves. So the question should become, what things have high specific heat capacities, what have the lowest? So what, if you push on, can it do nothing except for move faster? And the answer to that are noble gases. If you have just a gas, it's an atom, and you push on it, aside from electrons changing states, which is really not a big consequence here, the only thing it can do is move faster. Even if I take something simple like an air, so let's say I have a nitrogen molecule, and let's say I have an argon gas molecule. When I push on the nitrogen, there are things besides motion that can occur. And so the specific heat capacity of nitrogen is going to be larger than that of argon because of the fact that this can also vibrate and stretch and do different things. When I push on the argon, it's just moving faster. This is the limit of, of specific heat capacity or noble gases. And it makes sense if you think about windows. 
So if you've ever heard a window commercial, you'll have heard the phrase argon. Because a lot of times they will take the two glass pieces and then they will fill in between of those two panes with argon gas. Why argon gas? Well, for this reason. When argon, let's say that it's hot over here and cold over here, when argon comes over to here, it's going to take some energy with it, it's going to be moving faster. And when it carries it over to here, it can then release that energy to the cold, and that's bad. That's, that's giving us a, a heat loss from our house, or, 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 or heat loss from the outside to the inside, whatever. We don't want hot and cold to mix. Well, each time argon takes a trip across, it can only carry so much energy because it can't really be wiggling and scissoring and kicking and vibrating. Now, if I had steam over here, I had a little tiny steam molecule, and that took a trip. Not only was that moving faster, but that was also wiggling and waggling, and those can translate into energy over here, and that's going to cause a problem because now I'm taking more energy with each trip. Now, there is some things that are better than argon. One of them is krypton. Krypton has the same specific heat capacity, but it's bigger. And the nice thing about being bigger is that it's going to move at a slower speed at the same temperature. And so every time argon goes back and forth, the krypton is not going to have quite made it across yet. And so there are fewer trips where it's carrying the same amount of energy. So krypton would be better in terms of pure efficiency. The problem with krypton is that it's not as cheap as argon, which makes up about a percent of the atmosphere. And so, so in specific heat capacity, one of the questions you really want to get into is, why is the specific heat capacity different for water? Not just that it is different. Obviously, the fact that water has a spe high specific heat capacity can explain things like weather, you know, why the weather is relatively consistent near the ocean, uh, and things like that, why a swimming pool will heat up before a lake, uh, when the best time to go to the beach is. There's a lot of things that get explained by this fact. But we should also go through and say, well, why is water so good at this? And what other things would be good at this? What other things have a lot of bonds and a lot of strength in those bonds that can that have a capacity for lots of energy when they get pushed that they don't just move faster? Okay. And so then we can look at insulation and, and why does this particular insulation work well uh, in terms of energy storage and in terms of rates. And, and so we want to emphasize the fact of why this is so large as part of when we're teaching specific heat capacity. Okay.